Kokesh, activist, soldier, actor, politician, broadcast personality, uh, author, uh, if I include the Jefferson Memorial, the dancer, <laughs> you are a renaissance, well, my friend. Was, I was on the, when I was playing rugby in college, just for variety and physical challenge, I was on the ballroom dance team for a semester. So wow. yeah, check, check, Do dancer. We, could, we, oh, yeah. could we possibly see you in Dancing with the Stars someday? <laughs> I don't know which role I would be in, but yeah, sure, I'm, I'm down, I'm, I'm game. <laughs> All right. Well, um, outside of doing all the traditional stuff, we'll get into the hardcore stuff first. I thought we'd play a little game, if you don't mind. It's called Verbal Disassociation. I, I, I'm sure you remember this uh, going through training. But anyway, I'm going to throw out a phrase or a word to you. And all you have to do is tell us something, uh, anything, some utterance that evokes you, thoughts, words, feelings, memories, events, philosophy, or whatever comes to mind. Are you ready to play? Ready, let's do it. All right. Wait, wait, wait. Okay, now I'm ready. <laughs> okay. Uh, Gandhi's Satyaga. I think of how the founders knew that the best defense was the well-armed population that refuses to be governed by anyone, and Gandhi proved that the well-armed part is optional if you do it right. Excellent, excellent. The man. The man. Ooh. Well, you know, the show that I'm, I, I'm, I'm known for is the podcast and YouTube channel and everything else under the brand Adam versus the man. So it is kind of near to my heart. And when I think of the man, uh, I mean, I know that most people think like something really, you know, external, authoritarian, preconceived, you know, based on that. I think of the man as, as sort of anybody who's trying to control you unjustly. And in a sense, there's a little part of the man in all of us that we all have to conquer. <laughs> I'll get that. Or the woman, the uh, transgender, the, whatever we have, whatever we identify with at the moment. Well, hold, hold on. If, if I may sidebar for a second there. Sure. It, it, it's, it's one of the, the, I think, the greatest misunderstandings of libertarianism because of how it's been politicized. Yeah. And, and sort of taking, we've taken as a society our understanding of what should be this beautiful ethical philosophy and kind of come to define it in political terms, which is really backwards. Um, but one of, one of the worst misunderstandings is that it's, you know, because we're a male dominated movement, because politics is male dominated, and, and for, for, I'm not going to, you know, try to deconstruct all of that, mm -hmm. but the philosophy itself is, is freedom versus statism. And Statism is control and violence and domination. And freedom is peace and, and harmony and cooperation. Which one of these strikes you as masculine and which one feminine? You know, really, yeah. uh, it, if humanity is evolving to be in a sort of greater, you know, balance of rights, respect, energy, however you want to call it, between the genders, uh, I think. That, that, that sort of, I, I don't want to call it feminization, but that taking of toxic masculinity out of politics, or out of social organization, is, is a really critical part of, of human evolution right now. Ah, yeah, I, I could see that. How about this one? Re-enlistment. That goes from our <laughs> conversation from earlier. <laughs> But when I was uh, active with Iraq Veterans Against the War, there were a number of members who got uh, a pink clip tattooed on, their, on the edge of their hand so it would show when they were saluting. It's like, you know, the, the legendary Frank Zappa, apparently when, when he was drafted and was in, he got fuck you tattooed on his hand so that every time he saluted an officer, it would say fuck you. <laughs> um, but paper clip stands for people against people ever re-enlisting civilian life is preferable yeah there you go how about this one incrementalism a dance with the devil a dance with the devil okay <laughs> well just uh going through just want to let people know that you are running for president in the libertarian party in 2020 um uh, well, hold on will and if you're gonna say if you're gonna insult me like that <laughs> before you do 
on the next day. You got you to gotta give me a chance to explain myself, man. No, it, it is true. I, I am, I'm afraid to admit that I am technically running for president. I'm running for the Libertarian Party no- nomination next year. Right. Uh, but you really have to be some kind of psychopath. To, to actually want to be president, even if it's well-intentioned to, to think that you can wield this great power over other people that shouldn't exist in the first place. Uh-huh. It, you know, it, it, there's got to be at least something wrong. And it, it's, it's very much a contradiction of libertarianism to say, we think you should be free and this guy should be in charge of your government and <laughs> kind of in charge of you. You know, and they're going to have this authority over you when we're against that as a matter of principle. You know, it it, it really, it, I think, running on the platform of the peaceful, orderly, responsible dissolution of the federal government is really the only proper platform to embody mm-hmm. the libertarian values and message and, and statement of principles of, of the party. Um, you know, in, in, in this context, that's it's it's really the only ethical way to run for president. So uh, I'm not even going to put on the ring of fire or the, excuse me, the ring of power. <laughs> it's yeah. going straight into the fire. And my platform is to uh, resign on day one. I, I, you do not get to choose me for president. I will not serve as president. That is just I, against my principles. So uh, the platform is to go in and I, I guess I would be president as long as it takes to go in and sign one executive order or a pile of papers, however it is we decide to legally do it. But no, I am going in and immediately declaring the federal government bankrupt and of no authority. And so instead of being uh, a sort of sovereign institution as it is now, it becomes a custodial institution going through a bankruptcy proceeding. So the office of the presidency doesn't exist anymore. So I, with this executive order, will be resigning to be custodian of the federal government, which is very, very appropriate double entendre in, in a number of ways, cleaning up the mess in Washington. And uh, then we begin the peaceful, orderly, responsible process that leaves us with 50 independent states and up to 562 sovereign native nations. So, our, I mean, the libertarian argument really can go back to uh, even the writings of the Federalists and the Anti-Federalist Papers and the role of just where you have the governance of this, the individual states uh, that are, uh, you know, controlling. And when I'm saying controlling, I'm just talking about making rules of the road. Everybody's going to draw. We're going to try to avoid hitting each other by driving on the right side. Um, but then the commerce that goes between the, the states and, and so on. Are we going to try to blur the line, so to speak, so that we, we've already got most of these things uh, through you know, historically under, under wraps, don't you believe it? As far as uh, how most of the the rules of the road, so to speak, for society, for us to to live. Well, what's what's the role? I don't don't think you're wrong. Sure, we have to. Okay, well, hold on. Now, now you gave me a lot to deconstruct there to respond to. Um, First of all, when you when you talk about what is the proper role of government, you have to define government, Mm -hmm. and anytime you define it, and I and I, I I always challenge people very carefully. Not to describe it, but we need an actual definition if we're going to use this term in conversation in a meaningful way. And a definition gives you the edge of a thing. You know, it, it's this and it's not this. A very clear boundary definition of a thing. And, and when you look at what governments are, and I don't mean student body government or corporate government or other things that we might, you know, apply the, the word government to, but the sovereigns, the major you know, institutions that control all the land on earth. Uh, The only real definition has to be some version of government territorial monopoly on the initiation force because governments uh, are, are, you know, allowed or claim, you know, a monopoly right basically to be able to steal in their territory. And and as long as they call it taxation and, and, and the people are, are, you know, more or less willing to go along with it or not not capable enough of resisting. So to, to get back to what you said about the American Revolution, uh, I always would want to point out uh, in, in light of, of, of the picture that you painted there, 
what I see is the greater course of human progress. And this gets us past worrying about the personalities and the details and the immediate circumstance and what do they mean by this word or that word with the American Revolution, but giving us a deeper appreciation for it in the context of human progress. And the most important, or at least one of the most important dynamics of human progress has been the trend away from violence. We've gotten less violent over time. We've gotten more harmonious, more peaceful, more, if not biologically intelligent, at least intellectually capable with books and the internet now. We have gotten uh, the tools and the awareness to understand ethics. And ethics are basic principles uh, of human interaction that describe what is right and what is wrong and point us to way uh, to uh, point the way for us to to live a better life and and have uh, a better society uh, of people who get along ethically with respect for each other's rights and where we're at right now is, is a very unusual point in human history where we've we've generally accepted don't hit don't steal don't kill but we make these strange exceptions you know don't hit unless you're a cop and you're enforcing a politician's law don't steal unless you're an IRS agent. Don't kill unless you're a soldier sent to the other side of the world with orders, again, from a politician, bought and paid for usually, by corrupt interests. So it's like we've, we've really gone from you know, zero to, to 90% on ethics as, as a species yeah. over the course of our history. That's, that's an awesome thing to celebrate. So to your point about the American Revolution, the American Revolution <clears throat> represented a major step forward for humanity in terms of decentralization of authority and respect for individual rights and raising the standard of ethics, really, throughout society. But obviously, the founders and the framers didn't quite get all the way with that reasoning. Mm -hmm. Because if you apply ethics to government, you realize that government is a fundamentally unethical institution. And the sooner we evolve past it, the better. So what, what I've embraced as, as a means of achieving this, and this is partly based on uh, a slightly outside of the mainstream understanding of libertarianism that, that really says uh, on your own property, you can have your own government, you can have your own organization. It's not really government then, right? Mm -hmm. But right. you can have whatever customized experience you want. So a lot of people, for example, will say that, Libertarianism is pro-gun, and it's really not pro-gun or anti-gun. It's pro-self-ownership, which means you have the right to private property. Means that no one else has a right to tell you what should be metal in your possession can or can't be in, or control that. Mm -hmm. And I feel like I have I have pretty good credentials to speak from on on the issue of guns. As you know, I've done some firearm civil disobedience and done some time in jail and. You know, was a was an outspoken advocate of open carry when I was still legally allowed to, and I, I still believe that when people safely can, they should. Mm -hmm. um, but let's say, but in in the long run, I'm actually anti-gun. I know, crazy, right? Now, in my world, and in, 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 if if I'm in charge of anything, you will always have the right on your own property to own whatever kind of gun, whatever kind of weapon you want, with the only limitation being. Are you violating anybody else's rights? And if you're not, yeah. fine. But let's say, just for example, where we're going with technology. We might in 10 years have uh, an advanced form of taser that, that shoots like a laser beam. And if I hit you in the pinky toe, it disables you entirely. And so as a self-defense weapon, it has two advantages over guns. Because I, if I shoot you in the foot with a gun, you're just going to be really pissed off. If I uh, shoot you in the pinky toe with this laser thing, it's going to disable you, and I get to preserve the quality of your life. You know, most of the time, that's preferable. We're not trying to issue the death penalty on a spur-of-the-moment decision in the quest to defend ourselves. We want to defend ourselves as efficiently, as effectively, but also as justly and righteously as we possibly can. So in a world where that type of taser exists, it's not that you know guns would be banned, but they'd be obsolete. And if you came onto my property with, with a gun, I'd be like, dude, where's your taser? Can you leave your gun in your car? 
it's just it's unnecessary. It's an unnecessary risk. We don't need it. You know, if you get drunk or drugged or whatever, and and or, or you get a screw loose or you hit your head or whatever, you got a you got a taser. Can't do much damage. You got a gun. No defense advantage. More destruction. It's unnecessary. And then the other thing I'll say about guns is that being pro private property means that I have to support your right to form a community on your private property where you voluntarily or contractually agree to have a gun-free zone. You wanna ban guns in your home and your property and in your community where everybody agrees to that? Mm -hmm. I don't have a right as an outsider of that community to interfere with your right to set that policy. As long as you're not forcing on anybody else and everybody has the right to opt out or leave with their property, then I'm cool with that. And so this is a really important understanding that, that, uh, of libertarianism that I think takes us to the next level uh, of really being in touch with the principles of ethics, as well as pointing the way forward for how we achieve that voluntary society. And that's what really got me to the conclusion of, of localization of government, taking governments apart from the top down, getting them down to the community level where they can uh, you know, transform into voluntary institutions where they're small enough that, it, it, you know, as you localize right away, government gets more in line with the needs of communities and less corrupt, so you've got that advantage. People get a customized experience of governance, and when they take that to the logical conclusion, you're going to see very few social functions uh, really uh, of necessity applied in a sort of geographical area that's really based on legitimate communities rather than the, the edicts of a central authority. Sure. Now, um, what do you think, and, and uh, reading uh, Freedom, a uh, great author, nice book, 100 pages. Um, what do you think is, <laughs> there you go, buddy. Uh, what do you think is probably the biggest obstacle for people embracing freedom? Do you think it's fear? I really think it's simpler than that. I think it's just a, a lack of understanding. I think this mm -hmm. this general trend of human progress that I described could be a, a simple matter of solving a succession of little logic problems. Is it should I hit this guy, or would it be better to to to, to you know communicate with him, you know? And and then getting the, the you know before we had language, that wasn't a choice. Then we developed language, and then we developed better understandings and so on, and and, and we progressed, uh, you know piece by piece, I suppose, by, by a, a, a sort of continuous process of expanding our understanding of ourselves and our understanding of the world. So uh, that, that progress, I mean, you can, you can look at things right now and say, you know, when, when presented with my platform, there's going to be a certain part of the population for whom uh, the, the, who, are, who are who have embraced the un-American idea of militarism? The founders were against a, a standing army, you know, mm -hmm. and and they've really bought into all the propaganda, and they have a sort of false security blanket sense uh, with the the current status quo, and and we're going to see when the time comes at various tipping points <clears throat> what the greatest resistance is, and it may be fear, it it may be economic dependence. Uh, it, it may be other particular immediate factors, but I, I'm very confident in, in identifying that the, the long-term trend, what, what's keeping people from moving towards freedom is simply a lack of understanding. And, and that's something that you know, gets better every day. Now, is that, is that what the impetus was behind you, not just writing uh, the book, but the, uh, the distribution the the massive distribution that you had going out in uh, New Orleans um, was it? How, how many how many copies was it that was were sent out? And and, and how did you do it? Yeah. So, well, let me back up for answer those questions in order. <laughs> uh, when I was in jail for being in D.C. for the shotgun incident, uh, I did a total of four months and, and two in solitary. People started sending me books and, and they sent me all the great libertarian manifestos and all the great, excuse me, related texts that is, is, have, have gotten humanity to this current point of understanding. And, uh, you know, Rothbard was a big one for New Liberty, Ethics of Liberty. Uh, when, when I was touring and giving speeches every night, I could like rattle off 
you know, uh, like 20 names of authors that, that were the, the, the key ones. But now I've, I've got them, you know, in a thank you page and a long block of text at the back of the book. But what, what I realized is that there was, there's a certain body of, of, of information there contained within all the books that I was sent that represented my critical transformation mm -hmm. that, that really kind of encapsulated libertarianism as a worldview that was solid and irrefutably true that displaces statism. The idea that it's okay to solve problems with organized violence if you organize it the right way and call it government. And you can, you know, you can push ethics out of the way if, if enough people vote for something or whatever. Yeah. Um, and so I realized that I, I wanted the world, I mean, that, that was really the, the core motivation behind my activism was to take as much of humanity on this little intellectual journey, this transformation that I went through from, you know, volunteering for combat to where I am today as a voluntarist, because that small understanding, you know, 100 pages, if the world got this, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, we'd be able to transition away from statism in, in, in a decade or two uh, and, and have only, you know, vestigial institutions left at that point. So I, I if, if it, it was sort of like if, if, if I could get 100 pages of information in front of every human being on the planet, if I could get like one idea, one understand, if I could convey what I've experienced, you know, how would I do that? And so I took basically all the best of those books uh, and in and, 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 and the, the spiritual company of so many great authors, uh, mm -hmm. I decided that to, to write this book, I become the greatest ripoff artist in the freedom <laughs> movement, and I took all of their good ideas, none of their bad ones, and uh, and, and I boiled it down into this hundred-page book, uh, barely a book. It just feels like just enough feels like a book, you know. Mm -hmm. And and I think uh, this in, in this format, this is the ultimate red pill, and I, I feel pretty confident saying that because I had a lot of help writing it. I don't just mean from all the authors that I drew material and ideas from, uh, but from 300 people who were involved in the crowdsource of the editing and self-publishing, or rather, I guess, independent publishing uh, of this book. And to, to get to the next part or your next question there, um, it's always been intended for mass distribution. That's one of the reasons why I didn't want to get it uh, published by a traditional publisher is that it would come with a lot of contractual burdens and it would put it in the realm of intellectual property, which is in and of itself a racket, and that's explained in the book. And, and by the way, uh, if you have a, a reaction to that, I get it. Uh, that was, aside from militarism, intellectual property was the most challenging issue in libertarianism to, to really wrap my head around and, and have confidence in. But I, regardless of the way you think of the issue, I did not want any intellectual property claims on my book. And, and so I wanted it to be distributed freely online in every single digital format. So you can get it now, even as an audio book, you can get it in over half a dozen different languages. We have the audio book in Spanish at thefreedomline.com. And because it's only 100 pages, we can get it printed very inexpensively. And in, in all my actual sales of the book online, I do my best to, to keep the cost or keep the price uh, as close to at cost as I can get away with. But the, the last printing we did before the book bomb, we got 30,000 copies for 12 grand. Uh, that's including uh, printing and shipping from China to a warehouse in LA where I went and picked them up with a, a borrowed truck and, and trailer. So uh, 40 cents each. You know, I get bumper stickers and sometimes the bumper stickers cost more than the books. It's great. <laughs> um, oh, get this accessory or that merchandise. And it's like, the book's 40 cents. You want me to not give away 10 books so that I can, you know, print your, your $4 widget, you know, <laughs> get your merchandise thing. It's like, well, no, just focus on the book and focus on the ideas and getting ideas out. And that's been one of my guiding principles. So what I realized uh, on one of my tours for the book 
was that if, if we went to the next scale of printing in terms of quantity, uh, we could get them for under 30 cents each. And we could get them delivered by bulk mail through the United States Postal Service for about 34 cents each. And so we looked at all the cities that you know would work for this. And for a lot of reasons, we picked New Orleans. If, if people like me lived in cities, they'd be in New Orleans. I love it there. It was just there for Mardi Gras. I had an amazing oh, time. Yes. It's a city with an extremely high libertarian spirit and, and, and a high comfort for disregarding authority. Uh, it, was, it was great to see how the, the police and the relationship between the police and the people is fundamentally transformed during Mardi Gras. Really just, uh, but ref, you know, a, a cool, unique event, but also reflective of uh, the general attitude in New Orleans. And yet they have uh, some of the least libertarian city government. So I thought in a sense it could have a, a, an impact there. Um, so, but, but there were a lot, there were a lot of good reasons to do New Orleans and the books were delivered in January. Mm -hmm. It takes a long time to wait for the average American to read a book, Yeah. but considering it's only been two months. The response has been amazing and like 99% positive, you know, and, and, and if you look at, like, just to, to give you a sense of, you know, my expectations for this project being relatively low, um, our movement, and, and, and I sort of loosely define it, you know, as people who are uh, conscientiously, ethically motivated to be some kind of libertarian, not necessarily of that label, but people who understand the application of ethics to government and, and, and you know, do their best to craft for themselves an mm -hmm. ethically consistent and, and comprehensive worldview. Yeah. You know, we're about 1% of the population. You know, when you talk about politically, we're going up against the duopoly and their base, their hardcore, their real intellectual base, you know, people who will argue with you at a party uh, in favor of, of liberalism or, or conservatism, you know, they're each about 5% of the population and they're working together against us. So it's 1% versus 10%. You know, we really do need to focus on being converts and growing the movement. We don't need to, you know, convert everybody, but enough to lead uh, a meaningful political shift. And so when, when I deliver a book to every single residential mailbox in a city, <laughs> I'm okay if 90% of them go straight to the garbage if the other 10% get read. Uh -huh. and it's, it's pretty hard to say this early on. Uh, I mean, because I would, I would be happy if, if 1% of them got read. Yeah. You know, um, if, they're, if it's 64 cents each, um, you know, if, if, if one in 100 get read, that's $64 to get someone to fundamentally change their worldview. In terms of all the money that's been spent on libertarian activism, politics, media production, $64 per convert. I mean, we've spent billions since yeah. the 70s and this was like really uh, a new idea mm -hmm. and if you say there's that we're one percent that's roughly 3.3 million americans we're not doing that great you know when you talk about you know how many people have we if we can it is a conversion thing and it's not a religious right. conversion it's, it's a conversion to think for yourself hey when it comes to government think for yourself when you do enough you'll be a libertarian that's the conversion so i have no problem using that word but i, I do want to be clear with it sure uh but but if, if we've gone from zero to 1% and we spent, I mean, it'd be very conservative to say over uh, now almost five decades that we've spent, you know, just, just to give a, a, an easy number, $3.3 .3 billion altogether on campaigns and the, the party and, and activism and media production. That's a thousand dollars a convert. Yeah. You know, if you, if you, if you break it down that way, that's not very good. You know, by, by really by when, when, you know, by any analysis. So uh, if, if just, again, if we, if we take the movement in New Orleans where it was less than 1%, you know, and we double it from 1% to 2% essentially with this model, this is money very well spent for the movement. So that's my, my sort of low goal. My high goal being 10% would be incredible because that would, that would give us the critical mass to uh, turn the Libertarian Party from uh, an ideology party to a coalition party mm -hmm. and, and really start making some significant change. Well, it, Lenswick, do you have any idea if we have any concrete numbers of people that got interest uh, in that area that may have, uh, I don't know, uh, contacted the, the local 
uh, libertarian parties there or, or maybe joined up or maybe increased uh, Louisiana's participation it, it, in the LP? It's anecdotal at this point. We're mm -hmm. going to be looking back uh, over a, a several different time periods to analyze right. the impact. Um, I'm not planning on doing another one of these for a year. Okay. Uh, my, my, my dream plan and, and, you know, funds and circumstances available, I'd like to do Austin uh, in advance of the 2020 Libertarian Party Convention in January of next year and Washington, D.C. the year later and, and have a chance to develop and, and build this model, you know, as, as we go from city to city, ideally to eventually cover the country and the world. Okay. Um, well, maybe, so, maybe you can franchise it so uh, other people can do the same thing for you in other areas. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. And, and maybe there's going to be uh, another book that somebody feels, you know, on, on a totally different topic, perhaps on, on mental health or spirituality or on, on our relationship with science and technology or maybe even the Internet that, that someone feels is, is as critical to human progress as freedom is at this point. And part of what's really cool about this, part of what got me thinking about this is that, and you know this and as, as an independent media producer, that, that we're at a significant disadvantage still on the internet Absolutely. and we get censored, we get demonetized, we get deplatformed, uh, disadvantaged in all sorts of ways. And you can kind of cut through that digital clutter by going, okay, I'm going to put 204,000 physical books in people's hands that have a summary of the message on the back that have plenty of stuff to hook you and, and, and get you involved in different ways. And, and I think it's really important that we think creatively like this. And well, I will say one thing, um, I would normally say this at the end, but in case I forget, uh, since we're on the topic, anybody who's watching this, as much as the internet is a, a critical tool to human development, the technology and, and technology itself is fundamentally empowering. It, it means nothing without deliberate conscientious use. And right now, that means being a conscientious consumer of information. And if you like Will's show, if you like this platform, share this episode, support this platform, support the independent media, put your money where your mouth is, or at least a little time and effort in helping other people see the importance of a message that's not, I hate the term mainstream media. That's, that's <laughs> It's not even mainstream anymore. I mean, the, of the internet, the mess that is the internet is really more, you get more eyeball time, you know, than, than, much of what we, we think of as the mainstream news. So the, ye old corporate media might be a, a better term. My favorite, uh, probably my favorite philosopher, societal philosopher of all time has got to be Groucho Marx. And uh, he came out with, I wouldn't become, I, I didn't want to join a, 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 a club. I would never be a member of a club that would have yeah, me as a member. member. <laughs> yeah. And, and that's, that's almost how I feel the collectivist, uh, the collectivism of uh, trying to get a gaggle of libertarians together, and, you know, because we're, we're all individualists. We want to get that. And, and uh, we're always saying, hey, you don't control me. <laughs> It's hard to have that's a okay. you know, well, like that's, I don't I mean there's there's a sort of like you know appropriate market test of you know how we invest our our energy and our time as activists based on what we think is going to be most effective. Yeah. And it's nice when a large group of libertarians can can at least come together for a moment and and push on the same point and 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 bust a hole in in some uh I don't know I don't I, I got to be really careful going towards violence with metaphors, but yeah, let's, yeah. let's, uh, you know, let's push on one weak point of the state where we can, we can end in injustice. Let's put it that way. Exactly. Um, yeah. Because if I start talking about blowing up the white house, you know, I'm going to get more calls from the secret service and that's just uh, my phone bills. But, high enough. Yeah. Too. It takes up so much. So, um, <laughs> yeah, we're, Oh, but so, but, but if we never could, if, if, if libertarians as, as, as a you know, herd of wild cats can never march in the same direction, mm -hmm. that is just fine. <laughs> that may be the right way. It may be that my campaign in the history books is really pretty irrelevant, except as another fun, weird thing that we did as libertarians to spread the message. We got a guy with 50 state ballot access nominated him for president so that he could spread this message yeah. and, and that might be it it might be that, that what I, you know the, the federal government might collapse um and and just so you know i, I this is not you know i'm not trying to um present you know we're, we're having a, a casual conversation i'm not trying to yeah. present some like 
highly polished set of talking points. A strategic years. I really enjoy how this conversation has gone to talk about, you know, some of those bigger dynamics that, that are important to me that I don't get to talk about that much when people say, well, what are you going to do about this that agency and that agency? And it's like, oh, I was boring at this point. Um, you, know, I don't remember. you and I have to be about a, a half a six pack and, and a third oh. of the wall into it before we <laughs> start doing that. I'll finish. Got my train back. Um, <laughs> If we never can push together, yeah. we will still evolve past statism. A, a, a completely decentralized, uncoordinated effort of people waking up one at a time and making critical life decisions that one step at a time withdraw their material support for the state, that change their voting habits, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Maybe even lead them to vote less, perhaps to vote for secession. Who knows? Yeah. Perhaps. Just embracing Bitcoin cryptocurrency is going to crash the dollar and who knows what would come out of that if, if the federal government could survive a collapse of the dollar. Uh, if it has the, the public support to reconstitute after, uh, you know, the sort of worst version of that collapse. So it doesn't matter. Keep a smile on your face when people want to march in different directions because overall yeah. humanity dances forward pretty reliably. Two steps forward, one step back, but the course of progress is very clear. Well, I was going to take uh, the conversation in a completely different way. You have been on uh, just, you know, just going back, uh, refreshing myself on Adam Kokesh. I have been going through a bunch of video files and everything else. You seem to have so much fun when you when you do the interviews and so on. Uh, tell me some of some of the more fun. Uh, venues and, and interviews you've done in the in the course of your activism oh wow uh, you know that's like favorite <laughs> children <you> know? i know <laughs> i know i will i will uh i will share a little secret though because one of the things i'm known for in, in video production is my man on the street style videos where i do the socratic dialogue and uh you know challenging questions kind of kind of interviews and my favorite place is the strip in Las Vegas. Because if, when, anytime you go out to do man on the street interviews, you're gonna spend half your time getting rejected. Hey, do you have a minute to do an interview for my YouTube channel? Hey, do you have a minute to do an interview for my YouTube channel? You know, no, 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 but nowhere that I'm aware of on earth, other than the strip in Las Vegas, are there so many friendly drunk people from all over the world walking around who are expecting to be accosted on the street uh, by, by various entertainers, curmudgeons, pickpockets, and a host of colorful characters who make up the, uh, the wonderful community of the, the permanent residents, uh, semi-permanent residents of the Strip in Las Vegas. Yeah. A lot of people hawking skis. In fact, it's actually those people when I, when I feel like I've faced enough rejection for, for the hour that I'll, I'll just go and interview them, you know? And, yeah. and, and so a lot of my interviews are that. But uh, I will tell you, uh, I get asked a lot when you're going out and doing those interviews, Adam, how do you stay so calm and patient in the face of such stunning idiocy? <laughs> and it's not that the average American is an idiot, but when you get a cross section, you're going to get a fair representative share of the dumb ones. Sure. And, and you're also going to, I mean, to be fair, there are a lot of very smart statists, you know, uh, there are a lot of very, very intelligent people who have this one idea totally wrong. And, and it's important to acknowledge that just because someone is wrong about what is government or should government be or should it exist at all, doesn't mean that they're dumb or they're a bad person. But when I interview people with the Socratic dialogue technique and, and nonviolent communication, those are my two you know, sort of schools of thought that I, that I bring into those conversations. Yeah. You know, wanting to lead people to, to specific conclusions of, uh, of of my worldview to to understand something that, that that I believe in by walking them through that logic process using the principles of nonviolent communication to keep that a, a you know conversation positive and and to, to de-escalate anything that even arises as, as verbal conflict uh, and I'm you know these are ideals I'm not perfect or a master of any of these but um, when you when you ask someone uh, a series of questions for a Socratic dialogue where if they 
if they openly and honestly answer them and, and they're not bound by their preconceived notions, uh, you, you are asking them to like give up a piece of their worldview, mm -hmm. at least for the moment. And one of the things about getting people on camera is that there's this weird resistance to admitting that they're wrong. So, yeah. you know, in a sense, I have, when I put people on the spot like that, it goes one of two ways. They go, okay, I see where you're going with that. Oh, okay, you're saying if this, then that, and that, and, that, and oh, okay, that could be, or wow, I've never thought of that. That's awesome. You know, one of those sort of like positive, I'm receptive to that new idea. But the other kind, and, and this is the one that, you know, is sometimes more entertaining, is when people refuse. Uh -huh. to, yeah. to be a narrative of logic and reason and 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 i present to them a really obvious contradiction that they should be able to be like yeah i know that's a contradiction and i haven't figured that out yet but i'm pretty sure my conclusion of government is good for this is correct you know like that that's sort of the, the reasonable adult way to take that position mm -hmm. but most of them just end up embarrassing themselves and looking really really dumb when you go here's logic that contradicts your belief that i just laid out very clearly a series of questions and factual statements some of which i may have showed you on my phone or whatever or just things that you already knew about the world that are irrefutable and i went a plus you know a, a therefore b therefore c and and your answer was was why and you're standing there going no why 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 you know like, well Part of what's fun for me, that, that's the sort of, Adam, how do you, that, that's where the question, Adam, how, how do you stay so calm in, in the face of overwhelming idiocy comes from? Because when I've got someone like that in an interview, it's usually fun to just poke at them, you know, like, and poke at that contradiction and, and, and let them embarrass themselves until they either give up or wear out, or I've revealed all of the flaws in their position for the benefit of my audience. And so those videos are kind of like, don't be that guy. And I think a lot of people share those videos with people who would take that position going, so would you be that guy or would you? And then if you give the, if you give people the time to think, and this is the other thing about why, why a book and I should going back to, to the book mm -hmm. in all my travels, I, I ask people who are, how did you become a librarian? And I've never heard anyone say, well, I lost a, a flame war on Facebook, and so I surrendered and joined the Libertarians. You know, no one says, well, there was this guy yelling at me at a bar, and he turned up the volume just loud enough. I realized he was right about everything, and I was like, I should be a Libertarian. No, it's not. It, that, that fundamental adjustment of your worldview is a very personal process. Uh, there, there are relatively rare cases where people go through it with a spouse or a partner or a friend, but far more often, it's a book or a few YouTube channels. Uh, I mean, now people, you know, what's the difference between a statist and a libertarian? The joke used to be about six months. Now it's a weekend of watching my videos and reading a few Wikipedia articles to fact check me, and you're good. Um, so that process is accelerating too. But the secret weapon I have, uh, when, oh, and, and of the, uh, so of all those people I asked, it's almost always that quiet contemplation that leads to the conversion. And 90 plus percent of those involve the book. So like, let's make an easy book, right? Um, so in, in, when, I'm, when I'm dealing with somebody who, in the face of overwhelming, contradictory logic to their worldview, you refuses to even acknowledge that, and I'm just like poking at them. Uh, it, it is, or at least it was, sometimes uh, a challenge to, to stay calm. Mm -hmm. uh, because I'm so passionate. I, I have a hard time letting people finishes, finish their sentences when the first half is offensively wrong, representing some unethical position. I, oh, I can interrupt and I can tell you, oh, I, don't know, I know where you're going. You know, and that's not, that's not helpful. No. Ever. I mean, unless you're about to get hit by a car, you know, like, no, you don't, that doesn't help. Well, and, well, hold on, my, my secret weapon to answer that question is, most of the time I'm going out and doing those man on the street videos, I am stoned as hell. <laughs> and it definitely has a nice step slowing me down, making me a little more calm, a lot more patient. And it's more yeah. fun that way. Yeah, you have to medicate yourself a little bit before getting in. I get it. Uh, I, I, have to, I have to like 
dumb myself down to the status level, I guess you could say. Maybe, maybe that's it. <laughs> that's it. Uh, this brings me to something. I, You know, my twisted mind, I'm just sitting here doing all this you know, intellectual stuff. Oh, Adam's got this, and I'm reading about this, and Adam, and oh, I've got all this information on him, and so on. And you know what the, the thing that was getting in my mind is I was trying to put myself in your position, and maybe you can help me. Tell me that just the average day of Adam Kokesh, what time do you get up? What do you do? You know, are you eating grits? What's going on? Your average. Wow. Um, yeah, I've, I've, I've never been asked that way. I think most people who uh, look at me go, yeah, there is no such thing as an average day for that guy. Oh, <laughs> shit. Um, and it's it's too bad because, like, when I was, you know, up through college, I was very much a, a routine kind of guy. I mean, I liked adventuring and changing, you know, the routine to totally different scenes every every few months. But I was really into, you know, get up at a set time, go to bed at a set time, eat, and work out and, and go to class and go to work and all that, all that stuff, um, relatively regimented. Uh, but that's, that, that's not really compatible with the lifestyle that I've chosen for better or for worse. So, um, I guess, I guess I could, I mean, I could explain, uh, well, first of all, I generally have sleep problems related to PTSD. So, um, mm -hmm. that, that, that is a, a logistic, a daily logistical challenge. But I still manage to work out most days. I, I generally alternate between lifting weights and yoga. And uh, I'm, I'm a consumer, uh, conscious consumerism vegan. So my diet is, you know, 98% vegan. Uh, I, I, I never purchase meat. Uh, and I, I rarely, I purchase animal products as, as, as little as I practically can. Uh, I'm really more vegetarian when I'm traveling. So I'm just not, I'm not that picky about it. But, you know, it changes, you know, season to season. Uh, last summer, I got to spend uh, three months here at the farm in Arizona, mm -hmm. uh, enjoying my land and, and building my homestead out a little bit. Uh, then I was on the road. That was after being on the road uh, and, and for, for six months straight and only being home once during that six month period for a week. Yeah. Where, you know, there really is no routine. You're going from event to event and city to city and, and the logistics change, uh, you know, even moment to moment within that. So, uh, you know, and then, then I end up in jail every now and then. And that, that, that <laughs> kind of throws a wrench in any kind of routine I, I may have been trying to establish for myself when that happens. I, I think this is the first time you and I have ever sat down and talked where you haven't been driving around the road or going somewhere, <laughs> where you've actually been uh, sitting down. And <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and I, I obviously, I, since you mentioned it, I'm, I have a bit of an awkward uh, set here for this, and I'm about to start sweating because I've got this. I, I knew that was going to happen. My, my door glass here, but it's like the best place where I have uh, service for my sure. cell phone, sure. and um, my RV, the the bus that that I travel in, is in the shop right now. Yeah. So I'm actually living in in this building it's a little tire cave uh and i really shouldn't say much more about it for uh, legal okay. zoning reasons but um it's uh like a one a one room building thermal mass mm -hmm. uh you know packed with tires my, my my one big hobby uh or intellectual interest that's totally disconnected from my activism and it's not actually totally disconnected uh mm -hmm. but it's alternative construction uh cool. specifically uh, earth ships and, and uh, off-grid buildings of that nature that yeah. are striving to be uh, completely self-sustaining off-grid. Right. And for, for, for your uh, audience that might not know what an Earthship is, uh, it's, it's actually a branded concept created by Mike Reynolds with Earthship Biotexture as opposed to Architecture Biotexture, mm -hmm. based out of Taos, New Mexico, which is a, a relatively harsh climate. And he developed a style of building, uh, rather a package of building techniques to create a completely off-grid home that's built primarily from garbage or, or rather by recycling garbage in the form of tires, bottles, and cans. So the main building block is a packed earth tire. You take a steel belted radial, pack it with dirt with a sledgehammer, that dirt ends up denser than a lot of stone, and you have a 300 pound or so brick encased in rubber with a steel belt that can now be drywall screwed to another one 
where they pretty much nestle and hold each other in place when you stack them because they interlock and they're really heavy. Wow. But then you can put anything you want attached to them with drywall screws. They Now, when you say, I'm building a house out of garbage, people go, hey, what the heck? But <laughs> it's all plastered in. You don't see any of it. it, it right. But you get to have these, these large thermal mass tire walls that provide thermal stability and passive solar gain for the building. So when you have a south facing wall of glass, the sunlight comes in more horizontally in the winter and heats up the, the thermal mass of those tire walls in the back of the house and it releases that at night. So if you have one of these dialed in for your climate very, you know, precisely, sure. then you, you have no heating clean bills. You can vent warm air out skylights. You can, you can, uh, you know, there's different ways of manipulating the temperature passively. And in the summer, when the sunlight is coming in directly, you know, more overhead, less sunlight enters the building. So you have a, a cool thermal mass cave that doesn't require any air conditioning, no matter how hot it gets, because you can curtain off all the thermal gain if you want during the day. Okay. Uh, you know, the roof set up for water collection. Water is used four times in this model. And uh, that south facing wall of glass has a greenhouse uh, next to it that basically feeds you if you want, if you have it set up, you know, to, 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 your, to meet your dietary needs. You know, you can have a fully off-grid home that, you know, you got solar panels for electricity or wind or, or whatever it is that you want for that. And you, require, you know, your only inputs are sunlight and water. And from that, you can make life. You can collect water, you can grow plants, you can eat them, you can handle your waste, you can recycle your waste. And so I'm, I'm working on uh, some, some variants of this model uh, th that I think just take it, you know, evolutionarily to the to slightly next level of efficiency. Uh, but I'm not, I'm not like committed to earth ships. I just think that the, the intent and the approach and, and the package of technologies and techniques and concepts that are used to make them are, are just incredible. And that, uh, you know, especially when, when I look at, and when I say it's not totally disconnected, it, this, you know, the evolution of more conscientious living and housing is a, a really important part that it, uh, of human progress that's connected to progressing past statism and uh you know with uh well, i mean there's there's so many different intersections with with the government when you talk about the housing industry and, and how it can be changed and made better but one of the big ones that i look at uh as a libertarian as, as, as a uh sort of hidden consequence of government mm -hmm. it, it, it's not hidden really uh, and there are a lot of people who talk about this as a sort of secret agenda of the various string pullers in the super class. But the, the incentivization of people to live in cities and to live more densely and, and closely together than the technology uh, that we have alone would, would lead us to. Mm -hmm. uh, there are financial incentives created by the banking system that is obviously all uh, based around the Federal Reserve System enforced by government. There are a number of corrupt interests that would push us in this direction because we're easier to control that way. And there's been a general trend towards living in cities that is, is I think, primarily still driven by technology, but made a lot worse by government. So we get less cities, we get more handfuls of large cities, as opposed to a lot of really small towns yeah. uh, and, and, and community-based living and, and rural living, country living. And there are certain efficiencies. I mean, when they drive the price of gas up, you need gas to get around. Yeah, it's going to be cheaper if you can walk around a city than drive a car, you know, an hour to get groceries. But not only with solar and energy technology and information transmitting technology and the internet and everything like that, I think, uh, oh, and efficiency in building technology. Mm -hmm. I think we're coming to a pretty major leap in transportation technology, even just oh. self-driving cars, yeah. radically, I mean, and this is a technology we already have, radically reduces the cost of driving. Because right now, if you want to drive an hour, it's an hour of your time and attention, pretty much dedicated. Yeah, you can listen to podcasts, you can talk on the phone, but you are driving. That is an hour of your labor work that goes into moving you from point A to point B. Self-driving cars, now it's just the gas. Right away, your every equation about moving uh, building materials and where you live is mm -hmm. radically transformed. And when I was traveling the country 
and and reading alternative construction textbooks and and and, and you know manuals and, and all sorts of crazy stuff while we were driving around i would i would fantasize i'd be like oh look at that mountain how cool would it be to build a house up there <laughs> oh look at that mesa you could build on the tip of that mesa you know things like that and they're not practical with today's technology no but with drone delivery of construction material with with drone transportation that, that's really the bigger leap that, that i mean self-driving cars we have the technology the implementation is on the horizon yeah. uh, and that's going to be a huge leap but f drones flying flying drones that's that's uh, you're going to have drone taxis you're going to have drone delivery uh, yeah. the fact that you can now build a house in a remote area because you can fly in materials and have them dropped by drone that is going to radically transform uh, how and where we live and how densely and how many people choose to live in, in densely populated cities. And I'm really excited to, to get to, to live through watching that trend happen. I got to say, this was, this was a twist. I did not know you were a, 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 what a dirty hippie? Construction, a, a constructionist like that. You, you, you're a construction man. Um, okay. Yes, no, I, I am. I, I, I have like the first thing I got here was a shipping container and it's full of tools and materials. And I, I mean, I love it. I, I, um, one of my, my construction principles for longevity and low maintenance is to avoid uh -huh. wood as much as possible or any degradable material. So yeah. I really focus on, you know, stone, metal, cement, uh, things like that. I but, mean, I was uh, even looking at shipping container homes and stuff like I that. Love, yeah. I love, I love working with my hands. I love, I love, I mean, YouTube and, and I hate to cite the corporation that's so corrupt now because they yeah. don't censor instructional videos, <laughs> you know, like, oh, <laughs> we, don't have to worry, we don't have to worry about them, like, taking down a video about, you know, how to pack a tire full of dirt. They're, 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 that's they're, true. <laughs> and, and at least as, as a library of instructional videos for, yeah. for, for information and lessons for which video really is the most effective delivery format, yeah. YouTube is a... Uh, you know, incredible asset for humanity. Yeah, I think the technology has made us more of a DIY group oh, yeah. than ever before. Yeah, right. yeah, absolutely. I mean, the internet, you know, is, is, is such a critical turning point for the human experience. And just the existence of the internet, of, of the technology that we have already, that we've had for a couple of decades, um, if, if just that was fully implemented, you can imagine how society would be radically transformed. And it's really interesting to think that for a tool as broadly capable, as, as, as almost infinitely complex and, and rich as the internet, we may have only realized at this point two or three percent of its potential to yeah. change the world. I mean, the internet makes Bitcoin possible, decentralized money. Yep. It, it's here but it's nowhere near implemented yet in terms of like wide scale adoption. True. Um, you know, just the, uh, the information like on YouTube, the, the uh, trend to, towards unschooling or homeschooling as opposed to government schooling. There's, I, I mean, holding government accountable, just being able to distribute my book for free, just not having to rely on the mainstream media. Like even these obvious things of retail, transformed retail already, you know? And, and I think even these huge obvious things that we already see as, as transformative results of the internet, I think that's, I think we're like scratching the surface. I, I think you're right. There's you're absolutely so right. much more to come. That's really just from the technology we already have and artificial intelligence, you know, a, a yeah. computer that you can say, Hey, a computer, a computer, or what, what was it in Star Trek? computer yeah. um, please design the next fastest computer i want to do this and i'll say okay and i'll do it do it yeah and, and every human being on earth will benefit from this and and hopefully we'll all have access as well that's true that's true well adam again thanks for taking your time out of your day for doing this with me um we will be getting it, this out it's the uh, the freedomline.com uh, for those of us uh, that are going to be watching, get the book, read the book, absorb the book, listen to the book if you want to. Uh, if it's if you're in a different language, we've got other languages for the book. Uh, but uh, get to know the man, 
get to know the constructionist, <laughs> get to know everything about you. Um, well, well, if, if I if I may just end with with one last quick plug. Absolutely. Uh, winning the Libertarian Party nomination for president, historically speaking, has been embarrassingly easy in terms of organizing your people to go in as delegates at the last minute and uh, outweigh the base of the party or the established, I, I hate to call it the establishment of the party, but it's a fair term to describe uh, the regular state chairs and county chairs and people who show up to every national convention. Uh, the base of the of the party activists is, is, is a, a, a more positively poetic way of describing the Libertarian Party establishment, but um, mm -hmm. they don't fill all the delegate seats. And this nomination uh, can be won this year by organizing and getting people signed up. And this is what I'm doing right now with the focus of my campaign is sort of a, a, a preliminary early round of, of whipping delegates and encouraging, uh, like we, there are a thousand delegate slots and we've recruited 3000 volunteers in our last few tours of people who are willing to do this. But uh, how many will follow through? How many will still be capable? How many will be available the, the weekend of their state convention and the national convention? But it is really relatively easy mm -hmm. to be a Libertarian Party delegate to the national convention and get to vote on whomever you want to be the party nominee. And I'm not right now asking for your vote as a delegate, but I am asking you to get involved with the Libertarian Party. This is the party of principle. This is the only legitimate challenge in politics to the duopoly right now. And it is very easy to show up and make it what you want it to be. It is a walk-in. And I, I like to joke sometimes that if you I tell, go, go to some county meeting, go to whatever your local libertarian meeting is, see what it's like. But I, I got to warn you, if, if you get up and go to the bathroom in the middle of the business meeting, you might come back and find that you've been named an officer. <laughs> and that, that has, that, it is a joke, yeah. but it's funny because it's true. You know, that actually <laughs> has happened at least once that I'm aware of in Libertarian Party history. It's happened once going to the bathroom. It's happened once just walking out of the room, coming back. Hey, Bob, uh, you're the secretary now. Congratulations. <laughs> oh, crap. Whenever someone in the LP uh, says, hey, I got elected to county chair, I always go, oh, I'm so sorry for your loss. My condolences. <laughs> um, but it's, it's fun. It's a great group. There's a certain uh, you know, overhead of logistics and, and, and paperwork, but it's not much. And if you don't, if you want to avoid that entirely, you can, but it's an easy way to show up and make a difference. And I would ask to make sure that the Libertarian Party has the best candidate in 2020, whoever that may be, please get involved now, make the commitment and plan on being a delegate. And it, not, if, if you can't, at least being present at the, the 2020 Libertarian National Convention in Austin, Texas. And if not before then, I will see you there. Absolutely. You take care. You have a great, great time, my friend. All right. We'll be talking Thank to you, you later. All right. Have a great Peace day. Out. All right.